I, do I wait and what get the extra your, percentage? Were you 65 or 66? I was 66 and two-thirds. 66 and two-thirds, okay. And you've deferred to this point. I have. Financial Phil joins us right now. Philly, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Good, doing well, man. So what, what should John do? Should he take his, his 100% Social Security or keep building up to age 70 and get the 8% annual raise? Well, if John can tell me how long he plans on living, I can answer that question. <laughs> John? I'm, I'm heading for 102, but I'm not the deciding vote. <laughs> if, if you're going to make it to 102, then wait. If you're not going to make it to 102, the, the most common answer, and this isn't an answer directly for you, John, but a most common answer is to take it. That is the most common answer, especially if you're uh, – if you are using uh, investable assets to to uh, live off of, so if you're pulling money out of an IRA or he's not, a Phil. Roth or a four hundred one k or any type of savings at all, then turning your social security on is almost always the answer. But the second part of that question is how long you're going to live, and and most people can't tell you that other than look at their current health and their family history but there's a break-even point that you need to do the math on and it is it's it is the the most difficult question people ha- have to answer especially you know at those ages 62 67 uh whether or not to turn them on but in most cases uh the more conservative the safer answer is to turn it on uh at 67 it, it's a, it's a 14 year break even which yes is. And, it's, and so, therefore, being more conservative by going ahead and turning it on, making sure that you get uh, you get some of it anyway. I just want to spend as much government money as I can while in my time left. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when I was a little kid, there was a time, I think it was Jimmy Carter in the late 70s, where they gave away government cheese, free government cheese to seniors. <laughs> Does anybody cheese? remember that? No. <laughs> government, gov, they, I think uh, the joke, Eddie Murphy made a joke about it on Saturday Night Live, and the government cheese, G-U-B-M-E-N-T, government cheese, free government cheese. So... Uh, apparently, my wife's grandmother got some of this free cheese, and it was awful. It was just terrible. I don't know what kind of cheese it was. There was I don't know if there was like an excess in dairy one year, but they gave away a bunch of free cheese to seniors. I want to read the transcript or see the video of that meeting. <laughs> decided, Here's what we need to do. We need to give old people cheese. Oh, yeah. That's a great idea. Let's do that. Because you want to bind up as many seniors as you possibly can. Get them all bound up with cheese. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it was t- tough times in those days because of high inflation and and what have you. And and maybe instead of let them eat cake, it was let them eat cheese. There's an answer for everything if you if you look deep enough, Phil. Or not? Yeah, so they, if you give them a big block of cheese. That'll help. I, I like cheese. It's impossible to cut. <laughs> uh, Phil, uh, let's see. Uh, what are we waiting for this week? What's going to move the market after the gigantic Nvidia uh, earnings explosion from last week? We talked some about that this morning, and let's rewind back to let's, – let's go over the last four weeks. And I think this week is going to look much like the last three weeks did, uh, where there was a very important either earnings or report that came out on a Wednesday or Thursday. In the beginning of the week, we were kind of mixed results, a little bit negative, and then the major report came out. And that started with the CPI report. It was a little bit hotter than what we expected. Uh, based off of that, our markets fell, and then we led into uh, the the uh, PPI report, or Alphabet Soup of Reports. The PPI report, it told us much the same, but it didn't have as much impact. We led into that led into the third week, which gained the most attention and caused the most positive volatility, which was the NVIDIA uh, corporate earnings, and that was looking at the overall AI market, and that was huge. And you know, we we had a few days before the report, Nvidia gave up about eight or nine percent leading up to that report, something like that, leading up to that report, and then they exceeded all expectations. It was unbelievable, uh, Nvidia's earnings and, and how they had done, how they performed, and that lifted all companies that had any exposure to artificial intelligence and kind of regain what we had lost, regain and then some what we had lost based off of those economic reports. So there's the first three weeks leads us to this week. And now it looks like we're going down that same path 
where the beginning of the week would be kind of flat, negative, a little bit positive here and there until the PCE report, which is supposedly the Federal Reserve's most preferred measure, and that comes out, I think it's on Thursday. Now, we kind of know what that's going to say based off the first two reports, but if it's anything drastic, whether it's better than expected or worse than expected, that could swing our markets. I don't know that it would be as it would have as much weight to our markets anyway as CPI and Nvidia did. Those were the two big ones. I don't I don't know that it would be as drastic as what those two did, but that is what will move our markets today and and over this week. And I think and I anticipate without any outside information or unexpected information that occurs, I would expect to follow that same path that we have the last three weeks where we're kind of muted, flat, you know, n- n- nothing really to talk about at the end of the day. And then that PCI, PCE report could make us pop one way or the other, whether it's good or bad. As we speak, NVIDIA is approaching $800 a share, Phil. It's up almost $10 pre-market this morning, now at seven ninety seven plus. Uh, at some point along the way, uh, doesn't that bubble burst? It seems like it's gone up too fast, too 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 much, too fast. Well, you would think so, but they they seem to be the leader in artificial intelligence, and they've found a way to monetize that. And they're supplying all these other companies that are using artificial intelligence. And there's so many examples where we we had thought that hey, eventually this is going to pop and it's going to stop, and then and it's not going to continue to grow, and then it just continued to grow. And, it, it, you know, those companies being like an Amazon and Tesla, uh, Apple, and so also technology companies. But we had seen, we've seen that happen before where we, we, we continually thought it was, it was going to burst, that bubble was going to burst, and it just didn't. The burst and where it kind of lost some of its attention was during stock splits. If you recall, Amazon that used to – Trade at three thousand three hundred dollars a share or something. I don't remember what it was before the before the split, and then it kind of lost attention. So the sheer size of how much the stock cost gained a lot of attention. But after the split, it just kind of it, it just kind of blended in with everything else because it was more it was easier to purchase in, in small you know with the small price and small lots. But the now with Nvidia, you know, we thought that kind of when it was at four hundred dollars a share, and that was half of its price ago. But they continued to find a way to to monetize different areas and and continue to grow. Man, when they that price increase that they had last week was so amazing in, in what it had done to that overall company's uh, market cap. I, and I heard this; I didn't verify it. But I heard that their increase last week on that one day was larger than the entire market cap of Bank of America. Their increase in that one day. And so far this year, we've already had the largest market cap increase. That's basically how much the stock price increased times the outstanding shares. We had, we've broken two records. Facebook broke it first. So Meta or whatever they call themselves now, Meta broke it first after their earnings. That was the largest cap increase in a single day in history just to be followed up by NVIDIA that did the same exact thing just a few weeks later. So that, that is impressive, especially with that MAG7 as we've tagged them, um, the, the, those companies that have drug all the, other, all the other market participants with it and really raised the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So you would think that, and it, of course, it's a, I think it's a natural fear that eventually it's going to stop or it's going to give back a bunch of that those earnings. But every time it does, it just seems to recover even stronger. Yeah. Good morning, Phil. With Nvidia, I was impressed that the uh, their major operating unit is is so highly prized. It's delivered to a company in an armored truck. They don't trust it just going through the regular mail or regular shipping. So it's uh, it's it's very unique in that regard. Uh, don't know if you watched 60 Minutes last night or not, but there was they were talking they were talking to the ambassador of China, and he was making the argument that the U.S. The, ambassador to China, U, U.S. ambassador yeah. to China, yeah, uh, Burns. Uh, and he was making the argument there are two con- conflicting uh, forces in China now. One, the military military force that's trying to 
get all the data, control of all the data they can for military reasons. The other one is economic uh, force, and said the economic is uh, in some, running on pretty hard times in China just now. Businesses are not investing in China, uh, and we're in a direct co- uh, competition with China, the U.S. and China, for the economic dominance of the world. Uh, we have ha- we've been in that position. It looked like China was going to overtake us for a while. Now, with their problems, it looks like it's going tilting back to the U.S. Will that scenario have any sway at all on our markets and our, the attitude of our market investment? The U.S. markets as a whole, it has. It, it, it's been, you know, in the past, and I'll say in the past pre-COVID, because China has been an emerging market since late 1990s, early 2000s, where in an emerging market, we confuse it sometimes. In an emerging market, we think of an underdeveloped market, but an emerging, an emerging market is just identified as how quickly it's growing, and, and China has been that for a long, long time. And now, now we kind of look at India maybe as being the next emerging market, but they were in direct competition, and we were afraid – that their economy would soon overtake ours. But strange enough, um, our response and how we've come out of COVID compared to how they've come out of COVID has been that mark of that the piece of demarcation where we've really outgained it. So the overall markets, when you look at our industry compared to theirs, the U.S. equity market has far surpassed what China has done uh, in their market since then. So as an overall piece, yeah, we're, we're doing much, much better than China, and it has caused some of those, you know, when you look at an asset allocation mix, I'm, I'm going on a broader level than what you'd ask, but on an asset allocation mix, most uh, asset allocations will have smaller pieces of foreign equity than what they had before COVID. They're saying, hey, now, you know, you used to recommend maybe as much as 15 to 20 percent in international markets, where now that sits at about 8 to 10 percent. And I think a lot of that is due to the COVID response and how their economies came out of COVID opposed to how our economies came out of COVID. And I'm going to use that as a little dig to Rob to you have to give Jerome Powell some some congratulations (laughs) on that and some some thank you to Jerome Powell for that because our markets and our economy has done much better than most around the world as, as a response to COVID. Phil, I will give you this. Our Fed chairman handles the economy better than a communist dictator. <laughs> Man, you are stubborn with him. But he, to this point, you know, again, we talk about this a lot. But to this point, and, and the game's not over yet, but to this point, you have to be pleased with how the Federal Reserve has reacted uh, to COVID, whether it's bond buying or bond selling or interest rate movements. You have to be pleased with how they've reacted. I mean, you look at our economy as a whole, and it's got its it's got its flaws, and make no mistake about it, especially with inflation. And John would would certainly remind us that even though inflation's on its way down, it is still inflation, and it is the prices are still so much higher than than what they what they were pre-COVID. But it's better than what everybody else has done, uh, for the most part. It's better than what everybody else has done, and our job market is still fairly strong and continued to be strong. And it was really after the initial COVID blow. Our job market has been strong, and I, for one, didn't think that it would be. I thought eventually with the higher wages and and the increase in what you must pay people now, I thought eventually that would take a severe toll. Maybe it will eventually, a severe toll on our overall job market. And consumer confidence, that's the report that comes out this week. Our consumer confidence, by and large, the trend has still been strong. We're still willing to spend money. Now, that brings – up some some of its own issues you know when you have a consumer that is spending money and really nothing really breaks that cycle well you find yourself with too much consumer debt and and that's where we're kind of leading up on right now but i do remember that time just a, maybe a year and a half two years ago we really wanted to see consumer debt increase we really wanted to see uh, people borrowing money again not our clients but everybody else's clients Go out and borrow money, spend more than what you got. We really wanted to see that to to kind of support the overall economy, and and that has happened, and that brings about its own problems, which is why our economy is so cyclical. You know, part of the solution in a lot of cases also brings about another problem, 
and we'll eventually run into those. But if we can run when we run into those issues, if we can do it with a short lived recession or no recession whatsoever, you have to give the Federal Reserve really high marks, in my opinion, really high marks with how they <laughs> well, do it. Still, still, still shoveling that in there. Huh? We'll, we'll call this the kamikaze recovery. We're, we're making it mm-hmm. by having individual families incur more de- debt and committing financial suicide for the greater good of the economy. Is that, that has always been the case, though, John. Maybe not as drastic as what we're seeing right now, but that has always been the case because that is the those individual families that incur more debt than what they should and borrow more than what they should have always been the same ones. And, and I'll use an example here in a second. A friend of mine that owns a dealership talks about this. But they're the, also the same ones that kind of keeps our economy humming during difficult times because they spend regardless. And, you know, I was a micro example. I have a, a, a good friend of mine. I play football with him at Shepherd that he owns a dealership, and he often talks about – the, he calls them lot rats, and that's a bad name, and he'd probably kill me if I said his name for saying that, but it's the people that buy a car every year or two, and they can't really afford it, and they don't really need the car, but a new color has come about or a new model has come about, and they justify or they find a reason. But those are the best customers, even though sometimes, you know, it's like, man, we got to find a way to sell them a car. We, it's hard. It's hard to find a way to sell them a car because they owe too much money or their debt-to-income is off some. But those are the ones that keep them going. Those are the ones that make sure that the lights can stay on at the dealership. It's not the people that buy a car every eight to ten years and, and drive them until there's two hundred fifty thousand miles. They like you as as a customer, but you're not the one that keeps the lights on for them. And by the way, when you come in, you beat them to death, and they don't make much money off of you. You're not the ones that they like. The service department may like you, but the overall dealership they really like those people that come in every two years or one year and, and buy a car even though they don't, they don't need it and there's nothing wrong with the one that they have right now, but now it's time for a new tire, so I'm going to get a new car. And those are the ones that keep the light on, but for our economy, it is those family and is that subsection of, of consumers that keep our economy humming and borrow too much money that, that keeps us afloat during difficult times and kind of pulls us pulls us out. So we have to show some You know, those of us that don't spend money like that, we have to give them a thumbs up and say, hey, keep going. Keep buying that stuff that you don't need and and, and spending money that you probably shouldn't be spending because they do keep our economy afloat. I would just like to point out on behalf of our auto dealerships, which advertise in this program, we all need a new car from time to time, Phil. I want to put you (laughs) and Dave Ramsey in a phone booth together and see who comes out alive (laughs) when it's... (laughs) Dave, no debt, Ramsey. Well, Dave Ramsey can say stuff that I can't say, you know. So Dave Ramsey, who, while I listen to him sometimes, and I agree with probably ninety percent. I was going to say ninety five, ninety percent of what comes out of his mouth. But he can give, he can give advice, uh, broad based advice over over the airways because he's not licensed. He's not a financial advisor, so he's not held to that same That's standard true. that John and I are. So we got to be really careful with, hey, uh, when we give before, broad-based advice. Before we run out of time here, Phil, I want to bring something to your attention that I heard last week reported of one of the morning programs CBS runs, and that was a financial expert who said, with the deficit being what it is, she has concerns about the future of the Roth IRA remaining untaxable, whether that be the growth or the contributions. I don't know. But she was... Be- Going into a conversation, it was a sound bite, so there wasn't a lot of detail available there. How confident are you that going forward very, the Roth IRA growth will remain untaxable? Very, because, the, and, I, and I'm going to give you a political reason. So there's so many Roth dollars that are untaxable right now. Tell me of a politician or a side of the aisle that would make that taxable because they would never receive a vote. That would be political suicide to say to all these Americans that have deferred dollars, or not deferred, but tax-free dollars that we're now going to make taxable, I don't think you could simply, I don't, I don't know the legalities of it, but when you made an agreement, almost a contract with the IRS years ago, when you said, I'll go ahead and pay taxes, and we, we support this idea a lot, I'll go ahead and pay taxes on these earnings so that and put it in on the Roth side of the equation, so I don't have to pay taxes on it at a later date. And again, we really support that that idea. 
and then look at Secure Act 2.0. And the Secure Act 2.0 is the Rothification of, of American dollars because what they're saying, uh, really, the underlying theme of Secure Act 2.0 was finding better ways or more ways to to let people get money onto the Roth side or in some cases even force money over to the Roth side so that we have to pay taxes on it now and we won't have to pay taxes on it later. If there were any changes made to to our Roth program that came out in 1998, if there were any changes made to it, I don't think it would be retroactive to those dollars that's in it right now. I think it would be from this point forward we're no longer going to support Roth, so that's not an option anymore. But those dollars that are already there in Roth, and again, for probably the fourth time in, in, in the last two minutes, we really support that idea. But those dollars that are in it right now, I feel very strongly that they will remain tax-free as long as they're in there right now. So I have no concern about that. The only concern that I would have is in future years if they say, hey, we're no longer going to do this this Roth uh, idea because those Roth dollars do continue to grow as people catch on and they see that, you know, in most cases, if I go to Roth now, I'm going to end up paying less taxes in the long run. I'll just go ahead and pay it now instead of wait. I'm going to pay less taxes in the long run. Uh, It is becoming more and more popular, not just with people with financial planners, but with everyone, just just everyone on the street, even if you don't have a financial planner. Eventually, they pick up on that idea, and it becomes more and more popular and prevalent. And because of Secure Act 2.0, you'll be hard-pressed to find a retirement plan that doesn't have a Roth option uh, available in it. Only a select few will be able to ignore that, and those select few probably won't. So that will be part of our mainstream retirement planning. The, the, the recency of Secure Act 2.0 tells me that they're steering into Roth opposed to steering away from it. Phil, final thought is yours because we are just about out of time. Did you say Phil or Bill? Phil. P-H. Phil. Phil. P-H. So my final thought is for this week, and as you look back at January and February, it is bullish momentum. But as you look at this week, that PCE is going to be really important. And we'll remind people just because of the bullishness of the last year and a few months, let's not forget your overall asset allocation and steer deeper into equities because of what has happened recently. It doesn't change your personal situation. So if your financial planner or your advisor or your your savings, your your 401k savings plan says that you should be at a 65, 35, next 65 stocks, 35 bonds, just because equities have run up here recently doesn't mean that should change. No different than if it had dropped 20% recently, it doesn't mean that it should change. So you invest for who you are and what your goals are and not what has happened here recently. That, that's my overwhelming advice as always. Don't let that change your, your personal situation and how you're investing. How do we get in touch with you for more information today, Phil? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil, and have a great day, sir. Thank thank you, guys. We appreciate it.